I love a good burnt end, but I've never put a proper burnt end versus fake burnt ends, poor man burnt ends, whatever you want to call them. And they're often months apart. And I think, man, this is pretty good. It's just like a burnt end, but is it? So to find out, I'm going to cook a proper brisket burnt end alongside the two most popular alternatives to find out if you really need to spend a premium for the real McCoy, a proper brisket burnt end. Hey, I'm James from Smoking Dad Barbecue, and welcome to a fan request, which was, James, what's your favorite burnt end? This is a really hard question to answer when you cook burnt ends sometimes months apart to compare the real McCoy brisket burnt end to maybe a poor man's burnt end. I've done beef rib burnt ends, I've done chuck roast burnt ends, and I've done some pork belly burnt ends. Today, we're sticking with local to me, Ontario beef that I picked up from my local butcher to answer what's the ultimate beef burnt end. So as soon as I got these three cuts of meat home, I did uh, some salt brining like I always like to do with some diamond kosher crystal salt and just let those sit in the fridge uncovered. You also see in the clip here, I did uh, from showing that, go ahead and remove the flat portion of our brisket just so that we're really only looking at the proper brisket burnt end coming from the point section. And I'm gonna go ahead and save that for another cook. So today our contenders are a proper point end of a brisket a beef chuck roast, as well as some beef ribs with the bones removed. So these are the chuck ribs versus the plate ribs. So it's a four bone versus a three bone. And once they salt brined overnight, uh, we got ready to fire up the Joe. So let me bring you a little bit closer and show you how we get ready, fire it up. Okay, so we've got our charcoal basket all cleared out and I've also done a little bit of parting the seas here so we can make space for one oak log. I'm gonna go ahead and just bury this. Put that right on the bottom in the center and then I'm gonna use what leftover charcoal I have to cover it up and then we're gonna add some fresh big block on top. Okay, so poured out a few too many pieces. We definitely have some aptly named big blocks. So I'm just gonna pull out one or two of these uh, extra large pieces, put them back in the bag for next time. Okay, so that looks good to me. You can still see, I don't know if the camera's catching it, but a couple of the air holes are on the bottom along with plenty of air on the sides. And so all I've done is just build a little mound on top of that log. So we're gonna start our fire here uh, in the front center so it can burn towards the back and consume that log over the duration of our entire smoke. Let's fire it up. Okay, so we've got a really good fire going just to the front center. So let's go ahead and install just the base of our slow roller now. So we're gonna let the grill come up to temperature before installing anything else. But I'm gonna let this part uh, heat up with the grill all together. So let's go ahead, close the dome, and wait till we see our target temperature of anywhere between 250 to 207 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, our fire is rocking. It's even saying that our dome is reading about 350 degrees Fahrenheit, which is way over what we want. But don't worry, it's actually not that temperature. When we do the hand test, and I'll bring the camera a little bit closer to show that to you, our outer ceramics are not heat soaked. So we are not up to temperature just yet. What's often going on here is we've got some charcoal burning really nicely and some flames are coming up and hitting the outside. But since we know we've got a great uh, bed of coals going, we want to start making some adjustments. So I'm gonna close the bottom damper down to about one finger's width, as well as starting to adjust our top damper down so that we don't continue to race well beyond our temperature. We're also gonna take the opportunity now to install the rest of our divide and conquer rack, as well as our cooking grids. So let me bring the camera a little closer. I can show you the hand test, as well as assemble everything, and get ready for today's cook. Okay, so for the hand test, when you start seeing temperatures that are way beyond what actually makes sense, just go ahead and give the ceramics a feel. And so since I recorded just even that little introduction, the, the heat is getting better, but this is still nowhere near 400 degrees. I would not be able to hold my hands here for more than a millisecond without getting burnt at a proper 400. 
So let's go ahead and close that bottom vent down to one finger, as well as our top vent. I'm going to start to take down to just inside the first line here until we stabilize and we'll make some adjustments. I think for 250 we'll actually be, you know, about a quarter of an inch in from that first line. Okay, so now that we've adjusted our vents, let's go ahead and install the rest of our divide and conquer rack. I'm going to start by installing the divide and conquer rack itself. Okay, next I'm going to install the top of the slow roller and the top portion of the slow roller. And to make sure that we get good smoke versus just fat drippings burning, I'm gonna go ahead and install the X accessory ring right above the sole roller. So there's really only about an inch and a half clearance there. That's gonna serve a great spot for me to drop a drip tray. I'm using the Smokeware largest one that they make for Kamado Joe, Big Joe, or the Big Green Egg, because it actually matches pretty close the shape of the top of our sole roller. And that's gonna give us pretty good protection of getting drippings hitting the top of our sole roller, burning, and then creating that white sort of acidic type smoke coming up and maybe misflavoring our meat. Let's go ahead and install the grids above that. And let's close everything back up and let it stabilize. Okay, so I've just started to prep our burnt end battle. I'm gonna use some Frank's Red Hot for a binder, as well as Lane's brisket and ancho for our rub. And I'm going to use the meter block so we can keep track of each roast separately. So I'm gonna put probe number one in our beef rib over here, probe number two in our brisket point end. And I did go ahead and trim off the little bit of flat that was attached to this before salt brining it last night. And then our chuck roast. I'll take you fast forward while I rub the rest of these up with our binder and get some rub on them and add our probes. Okay, our grill's up to temperature. Ceramics are exactly where they should be for about 250 degrees. We'll confirm the great temperature in a second once our meters are installed. Let's go ahead, open it up, and add our burnt end battle. First up, I'm gonna put our brisket, probe number two, our beef rib, and our chuck roast. So just keep an eye on these, make sure that they cook evenly. I'm trying to center them best I can just over the drip tray. And if we need to make any adjustments, we'll do that in a couple hours just to move them around, make sure they're cooking evenly. But I think that will be just great. One of the advantages of the slow roller is just how even the grid surface is. I've done some other tests and there's only been about a degree or so difference between the front and the back. So I'm not too worried about their orientation. Let's put them to bed for a while. All right, it's been two hours and the smell out here is incredible. Just getting some of that sweet, sweet oak smoke. And as you can tell, smoke is running clear. You're not getting that white billowy smoke. That's two reasons. One, we're buried underneath our coals, which is coming up through the fire and it's purifying it, getting it to the right temperature for the perfect smoke taste. And that's having a drip pan removed from the heat source so they just don't burn up and create any of that bad smelling smoke. So now it's time to add a little bit of spray. So I've got a spray bottle here just full of water. You can use a little apple cider vinegar or some mixture of hot sauce if you like, but I find water works just great. And we're gonna rotate our divide and conquer rack to the, you know, to the right. So do a little brisket burnt end merry-go-round. How awesome is that? I'll move the camera a little bit closer. Oh yeah, that's looking good. So a little spray here will just again help anything from drying out. And in this early stage, in the first few hours of a smoke, this is where the smoke really adheres to the meat. And so this little bit of spray is going to help act as a bonding agent for that smoke and build a great crust. So let's go ahead, hit this with some spray and I'll rotate the grid. All right, our first turn of the burnt end merry-go-round is complete. Let's close everything back up and we'll give this another hour or so before our next spray. Okay, it's been about another hour and 20 minutes since our first spray, so let's bring the camera a little bit closer. And also to point out our meter probe sending me alert saying, 
our proper brisket is getting close to being 165 degrees, whereas the other two are both trailing a little bit further behind. It makes total sense. It's much thinner than those two thicker cuts. So what the game plan is not to be too concerned about the 165. I'm looking for the bark and the texture. And many, many times that's actually closer to 180, 185 before I even want to think about wrapping. I just set it for 165 so we can keep an eye and uh, just double check where we are with our bark and make some adjustments, especially since we have three different cuts of beef that'll all cook at different times in terms of their uh, relative doneness. So let's bring the camera a little closer. We'll do a bark check as well as another spray, but I think we are getting much closer to wrapping our first cut, which will likely at this point leading the doneness be our proper point end of the brisket. Okay, so riding along about 265 degrees. Oh, these are looking good. Let's go ahead, give them another spray and another turn on the merry-go-round. Rotate things one more time. All right, we are at the five hour mark and we're anywhere between 158 to 165 degrees. So it's time to give it our last spray of the afternoon before we get ready for our wrap. And I'll let this go anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes just so that spray gets uh, evaporated and absorbed into our beef. And then for the wrap, what we'll do is we'll make up a little bit of sauce. So that's just gonna be some barbecue sauce with some apple cider vinegar to serve as our braising liquid. And we're gonna use the exact same sauce later on that we wanna pack up when it's ready to serve our burnt ends. I'll bring the camera a little bit closer so you can take a look at some of the awesome things going inside our Kamado Joe Big Joe behind me. All right, last spray and merry-go-round. All right, it's getting dark, but these look amazing. So I'm gonna take you fast forward mostly so I just don't end up blocking the camera standing in front of it doing all this. But let me explain what I'm gonna do just before we get started. So I just grabbed a mason jar, um, some apple cider vinegar, along with some barbecue sauce. You can use any one that you want. Uh, I happen to be looking for a uh, low sugar. So this one is only, you know, two carbohydrates before about every two or three tablespoons. So I wanna try and keep the sugar down, but use your favorite barbecue sauce here. So what I'm gonna do is just put a little bit of this in, mix it up and I'll have this as my braising solution. Get out some foil, transfer each roast into the foil, add just a little bit of uh, braising liquid to each pouch, wrap it up tight and we're gonna put it back on the grill and bump the heat up to about 300, 350 degrees until we reach an internal temperature somewhere around 200, 205 degrees is what I'll be looking for. Then we'll let these rest, we'll cube them up and make our burnt ends. So that's what we're in for for this last chapter. Let's go ahead now and make up our sauce and get these wrapped. Let's do our beef rib first. Oh, that looks good. So I drop it there. Nice bark on that. So what we're looking to get is just a little bit of coverage, not too much, because uh, this will still push out some fat as it cooks but just enough to coat the top and get a couple tablespoons on the bottom of each pouch. That should be plenty. Wrap that back up. Okay, next we'll grab our chuck. And again, getting really nice bark all the way around. Really excited to try this one. Oh, that's looking so good. Incredible smell, Woo! as I drop it. Let's move that over, wrap it up. All right, our meter probes have done their job, so I'm gonna take them inside, clean them up, along with all the extra stuff we no longer need, like our spray bottle, tin foil, et cetera. And so what we're gonna do is count on about 20 degrees Fahrenheit per hour in foil. So if we're sitting around 170, 175, I'm gonna to plan to check this in an hour. It may take a little bit longer, but I'd rather just know that ahead of time versus going beyond. So I'll see you in another hour when we're ready for our next step. All right, so two of our three are done. We've got our beef chuck ribs right here. We're gonna do our poor man burnt ends with those, poor man burnt ends with our chuck roast. Needs a little bit more time and our brisket point ends. So I'm gonna go ahead and take these first two inside and let them start to rest. And we'll give this maybe another 10 minutes or so and check on it again just to make sure we're getting that 205. And I'm not really concerned about the temperature so much as I am the feel. This one had a little bit more tension. So we'll just give that a touch more time 
and I'll rejoin you when we're ready to start slicing these up after letting them all rest together for about an hour. All right, I brought each of our pouches in. I just went and added some marker on the foil pouch so we can keep track once they're all cubed up. That'll be a lot more difficult versus them holding their shape right now. So I'll take a fast forward, but the plan is just to transfer each roast onto our board, cut it into about an inch and a half or so cubes, and then uh, move them back into their foil pouch so they can rejoin those juices that have been pushed out from our cook. And we'll just toss in a little bit more sauce mix them up and I'm going to take everything back outside and I'll meet you up there so we can finish these on the grill for 15-20 minutes let them tack up. Just come out a fast forward for a second so you can take a look at our beef rib but as you can just see tons of juices forming out of that when I give it a little squeeze. So I'll just continue to slice this up and put the cubes in the foil. Take a look at our chuck roast here. Hopefully that's coming through, especially near the bottom part here, just running full of juices. Looks really good. All right, last but not least, we've got our brisket point. Let's go ahead and slice this up. So definitely lots of juice. In fact, I think this one looks the juiciest of them all, just running everywhere. I'm excited. All right, so now we'll just go ahead and add a little bit of our sauce to each of our pouches and put those back on the grill for about 10-15 minutes so they can tack up. All right, let's check these out. So keep in mind, I'm choosing to do a keto friendly sauce, which won't have as much sugar. So these are not going to tack up as much as they would with a normal barbecue sauce, but they are still looking really good. So let's just check our packages here. If I can find my lettering, this is a BR. So this is our brisket. This is our chuck ribs at the back. And so this should be our chuck roast. Yep, there it is, perfect. So, just like the anatomy of a cow, why don't I grab one from Chuck Rose at the top, move down the midsection, grab some of our chuck, uh, beef chuck short ribs, and then last but not least, our brisket. So to try and keep track of everything here, I'll put sort of one toothpick in our Chuck Roast, two toothpicks in our short rib and the brisket will be without a toothpick and I'll just use one at the end so we can keep track of what's what. All right, let's dig in. So let's start with number one, which is our chuck uh, roast. That is a really promising start. That's a chuck, chuck roast. All right, let's move up to our short rib. So what I'm getting, I'm getting both of them, you know, really great tenderness. Uh, the smoke is spot on. In terms of texture, for double the price, for moving from just a chuck, uh, and all these are uh, prime grade from my local butcher, by the way, uh, but moving from chuck roast to the chuck short rib, I can't tell the difference. They, they taste the same, uh, except one's half the price. So right now, from a value perspective, I think the chuck short, uh, or the chuck roast is ahead of the short ribs. Let's try the, the proper point end of the brisket here. Get a good one, looks good. Okay, those other two, you're fighting for a millimeter. Uh, you know, difference in terms of uh, separation. That last one, down the field, you know, first down, that's an amazing, uh, you know, burnt end. And so I've never had the opportunity to compare the two side by side. It's often months apart. I'm so glad we were able to put these two or three head to head and just be a reminder, there's no substitute for the proper brisket burnt end. 
If you'd like to see this versus anything else, maybe pork belly burnt ends versus beef burnt ends, more than happy, let me know in the comments down below if you'd like to see that video. But until next time, I'm James from Smoking Dad Barbecue, getting ready to sign off. But before you go, if you enjoyed this video, please let YouTube know by smashing that like button and let me know by hitting subscribe to catch future videos. So I'll see you in the next one. Don't be afraid to fire it up.